you want compliments, just tell them what to say, okay? <laughs> They're willing to say it, you just gotta tell them what to say. All right, question number two. Women, never ask a man in your life again. Again, we're getting ready to go out. Um, do you think that this dress kind of makes me look big? No. You are being so sweet, and I appreciate it. But I really need the honest, because I, I'm going out tonight, so be as honest as you can. Do you think, women, shame on you. Man, do not fall for that. She does not want the honest truth. She can't handle the honest truth. And women, shame on you. Don't you ever ask a man in your life again about your weight. You have a scale. Get on it. <laughs> if the number's high, the butt is big. They go together, okay? You do not have to involve him at all. Bless his heart, he's just trying to act like he doesn't see a growing, okay? <laughs> Question three, what's your favorite sports team? The Marlins. Okay. Florida Marlins baseball. We are married. You have a hundred inch screen flat TV. You have a remote control, a cool drink, a box of snacks, a second remote. The Marlins are about to make the most amazing play in the history of mankind, and you're going to see it in real time. And this is going to be such an amazing play that it will change the nature of baseball forever. It's going to happen in about three seconds, and you're going to see it as it happens. Question number three, never ask a man in your life again. So what you thinking? <laughs> Women, it's about timing. With men, it's about timing. That's why they have halftime, okay? <laughs> Question four. We're in the Bahamas. We've had the most absolutely wonderfully romantic weekend. Question four. Honey, do you think that woman is prettier than me? <laughs> of course she's prettier than you. You're the one that picked her out. <laughs> if you want to know to that question, pick out someone 80, not a 23-year-old. <laughs> and man, there's only one right answer to this. I know the answer. What woman? <laughs> the score is now Randy won me three. Yay! Okay. And question number five. Last one, never to ask a man in your life again. You've had a horrible day at work. Worst day that you've ever had in your life. Do you have a favorite chair or couch at home that you like to relax on? Yes. Uh, what color is it? Black. Black. Ebony. We call it ebony. Okay. So, or maybe charcoal. It could be either one, but there's a difference. So, you have walked in from your worst day at work. All you want to do is get on that couch and relax. I intercept you. Question number five. Honey, what's wrong? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing? Nothing? I mean, something's wrong, Randy. I know you. I could tell the moment you walked in. I mean, you, what's, is, did you have a bad day at work? Yes, I had a bad day at work. Oh, oh you had a bad day at work. Yeah, what about my day, Randy? What about my day? <laughs> I mean, at least your day is over. You know, my day isn't over. Because now I have homework and baths and my day is never over. And you know what our problem is, Randy? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> Randy, we don't talk anymore. We don't communicate. You don't share with me. Where do you see our marriage in 10 years? You have no idea. <laughs> never mind. Just go. Really, just go. Really. just walked away? <laughs> I can't believe you just walked away? We are in the middle of one of the most important discussions in 
our relationship. And you just, you know, oh, I wish I could walk away. I wish every time I didn't want something, I could walk away. Nice try. Brandy, do you have any idea what I need? No, okay. Let me tell you, Randy, so I don't need your patronizing. I don't need you to fix everything. Sometimes, Randy, sometimes I just need a hug. guys like it. Um, just funny, funny mm -hmm. things there. So we'll start with prayer um, and then we'll dive into the topic at hand. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. Thank you first and foremost. Being grateful for the couples, the marriages are here, but also being grateful for those that come individually every Saturday or every Sunday to this class to learn more about marriage, to learn more about your beautiful and highest glory Jesus also we pray for those husbands that are not presently in this room as of now that you bring them closer to your feet also for those women that are not Jesus that you show them the light and show them that the best gift you have given us is marriage father that you come first and then our wives and our husbands come before you after you father we thank you please allow this class and the topic that we're going to teach on today to be of enlightenment to touch anybody in this room who needs it, Father, and to allow my wife and I to continue to be together, bonded, Jesus, under your sacrament, and that every couple in this room will continue to glorify you, give you grace, and all the whole, and all the glory to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to continue teaching out of Jimmy Evans' book. Today we're te teaching on chapter 4. Uh, the name of the book is called When Life Hurts. It is actually a very nice book thus far. I, I've enjoyed it. I think Shannon shared that last week, but I, I did. Uh, it, it was a great topic this week. And chapter four talks about when hurts hides. Uh, and, and, and it's funny because I think it talks about a lot of times we have every single person in one way or another always has something that we mourn or pain that is inside of us that we continue to build upon. Uh, a pain that is hidden inside of our bodies, inside of our hearts, and that we continue to prolong them with time. So it, it starts, on the book, it gives us kind of a, a preface on, would it be nice that when God is con continues there for us? I think by a raise of hand, does everybody here have kids? Yes, for the most part, okay. And we can also agree that probably everyone here will do everything they can for their children, say when they were one year old or when they're 60 years old, right? So it talks about that we could be there emotionally for them and that if we're going to continue to be emotionally there for them when they get hurt, when something happens, if something continues to occur during life, when they become older and they have kids, they're going to continue the same tradition, right? Well, that would be utopia. We would love for all of that to happen, I think. A lot of the problems we have currently in society will not occur. Well, and a lot of that doesn't occur because of the pain and the suffering we continue to build on. So the book goes, and then kind of the title of this, which I like to call the thesis of this chapter, uh, is Does Time Heal? Okay? You constantly hear the saying, when something bad occurred, someone always told us somewhere or another, time heals it all. Right. Okay? Don't worry, let it, let, it, let it just prolong it. Something along the lines, time will heal it, right? Cry, cry three days, by the fourth day you're good, time will heal it all. My wife always said that, hey, when, when we went through our crisis, she says, oh, I need to cry three days, then time After will that, heal it. I'm done. Then I after that, I'm done. That's, 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 a good, that's a girlfriend thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's just, I'm sorry, it's baloney, right? Because 
That is a complete lie. Mm -hmm. Because time, what only time is going to do is continue to build upon that. So in this case, for example, we'll talk about a little bit. My wife goes into surgery this coming Monday. She's been going through a problem inside her uterus for a long time. For many years, she's knew this, that she's been prolonging the anticipated, which is surgery. And she knew she had to get this fixed one way or another, but for the past seven years, she has continued to let that pass. Her saying was always, oh, time was gonna, time will fix this. Yeah, time will fix it. Time will fix this. And God will fix it. And God will fix it. <laughs> God has shown her now that she needs to go into a surgery room, right? Every door has opened for her to get fixed, right? She's still fighting that. Right? Because she continues to say, time is going to heal everything. I'm still waiting for my miracle. Yeah. It's going to happen with the doctor. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, but, you know, she was just sitting down. Oh, I'll just sit here in this chair. I'll recline, and time will heal my, my fibroids in my uterus. When it was one tiny one, now she has three big ones that, you know, threw her in a hospital a month ago. So, time doesn't really heal it. It continues to accumulate on some of these wounds. Uh, so... One of the many aspects that we do have is those unresolved wounds remain deep in our hearts and in our spirits. If we are not able to solve them ourselves, they're just going to continue to accumulate, right? Because the more unpresented wounds we suffer, the more they grow and the more, the more they accumulate with time, okay? So... You know, one of the things that also goes with that timing is they always say that the actions you do follow someone's heart. Not necessarily, because you cannot always base it on, on the, uh, upon that. You say, oh, well, that person is an alcoholic or he drinks too much. Therefore, he's a bad person. Oh, that person is a, a sex addict. Therefore, he doesn't have a God's heart. No. What that means a lot of times is that person has so many unresolved issues in their hearts that they lead into an addiction or into something that, or, or, or into a problem, to a drug or into an alcohol that then leads to an addiction. For example, a wife or a husband who is not sure about talking sexually with their husband or with their wife openly may not be because he or she doesn't love their counterpart. It may be because there's some unresolved issues from that person's childhood, from that person's maybe they had an episode of sexual um, abuse uh, or, or, or something within their family that doesn't allow them to come open into their counterpart to continue to do that. So there's some unresolved issues there and time has not healed it because if it happens in your childhood and now you're married and you're not allowing that barrier to, con to, to be broken, is, is, is now leading into communication issues. It's leading into problems in intimacy. And then you end up with pornography, sexual addiction, uh, uh, cheating on your uh, fornication, so forth and so on. Right. Okay. So we, we actually had an episode probably like two weeks ago with uh, my daughter's father. He is a person that he suffered a lot of like, I guess, abuse. I don't want to say, yeah, probably, yeah, physical abuse uh, from um, his parents when he was little. So he grew up to be a person who's bitter, who is resentful, who does, he doesn't believe in God at all. And, you know, I'm, very, I'm grateful that my daughter didn't actually get to grow by his side, but she's had the opportunity to share with him every summer and every um, Christmas she goes there. Now, for the very first time this year, she decided not to go. It was her choice. Uh, but, and so I registered her in kickboxing classes. And so we bought all the gear and everything for her. Uh, but she was missing the bag for, you know, to put the gloves on and everything. And so I told her, why don't you call your dad and ask him for the bag, you know? And she was like, okay. So she called him and he was in a bad mood that day, like in a really bad mood. And he just answered, you know, like with a like punch, I literally to, to her. And he was like, so uh, I can't wait. That was his answer. I can't wait for you to be 18 years old so I cannot 
I, I can stop providing for you. I don't have this financial burden. Burden on me, that's what you say, yes. And her face went, oh, you know, and she started crying and she was like, I cannot believe this. So I was like, all right, all right, we have to let you go. So I let him go and then I was apologizing to her. I was like, you know, I'm so sorry, Sabella, that I made you call him and ask for, you know, that bag. It was not intentional. And she was like, no, mom, it's not the bag. It's his words. They were so hurtful. I mean, I cannot believe I'm a burden for my dad. And so that minute I realized, you know, that I needed to heal my daughter's heart and I needed to explain to her that he is so full of pain and so hurt inside that the only thing that comes out of his mouth is like crazy. So he doesn't realize that he's being hurtful. He doesn't realize he's being mean to somebody he loves because I, you know, I know he loves her. But whenever he feels attacked or whenever he feels pressure, he will actually just throw poison at you. And so that's what happens when you actually, you know, keep your pain and when you actually um, don't let, don't, you don't resolve that hurt that you've had in the past. Uh, okay, so, and there's three ways that us as individuals or couples, we deal with pain or according to this chapter in this case. So the first one is we medicate, okay? Second one is we motivate. And third, we meditate, okay? We'll kind of jump in a little bit there. Not sure what's going on, but on the first one where we medicate, okay? So I'll tell a Bible story on that medicate part. So King David, okay? We all know the story of him going against his own best friend to have sex and have a child with his best friend's husband, uh, wife. And then he gets this best friend killed in battle. Well, within studies in the Bible with King David, it is told that he had about eight wives and ten concubines, which they conclude that he had a sexual addiction. Right? So... When you look at it, well, people think, oh, my God, King David. I mean, he was anointed by Jesus, right? He, he was really loved by God. But then people may say, well, he was such a bad person. How can he have a wives? How can he have a child with your best friend? How can you have your best friend killed? If you, if you take three steps back in King David's life, okay, he comes from a family of seven brothers, okay? They were, they were a family of shepherds. Well, King David was the youngest of all in that family. Within that seven, the father never really recognized David as a love child, similar to the story with brothers in Joseph's life. In this case, with King David, uh, the brothers hated him. They treated him really badly. He was always on the fields working, even though he was the youngest. When Jeremiah came to anoint him, right, to find that to anoint King David, he came into the house of David. Well, it was the father with the remaining <clears throat> children, and he anoints all of them. And he tells the father, none of them are the ones Jesus, uh, God has anointed to be the next king. And the father, and he asks, do you have an extra child? Ch child says, yes, he's out there on the fields. He didn't even refer to him as David. He referred to him as he is out there on the fields, right? So ways of rejection. Well, Jeremiah finds King David and anoints him and says, you're going to be the next king. When two of the brothers go into battle, the oldest brothers go into battle against the Philistines and, uh, and Goliath, King, uh, uh, young David gets sent to the battlefield with food and, and water to be brought to the soldiers in this case. Again, the br older brothers are telling him, get away from here. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. You should be taking care of the sheep and the fields. You should not be here. Well, we know the story of what happened that day when King David beat a Goliath. Even in that moment, the brothers continued to reject him. Okay? David went to be the king. One of the brothers decided to still be against him and plotted a whole thing to go against rejection. Then you go even with the king at that time, who, because when he defeated Goliath, was still in rejection. So now you're dealt with King David, with David's from an early young age to the time he becomes king, with continuous moments of pain, 
rejection, objection, people telling him, you're not supposed to be this person, we don't like you, we don't love you. What is that pain made of do? Going to the medication part. What was his medication? Sexual Sex, addiction. sexual addiction. Similar to people who go through a pain in their lives, and one of the first things we tend to do is, and I'm guilty of this, going, pour myself a scotch with some ice, and then start drinking it. In the past, every time something hurt, when I was younger, I used to call my buddies. Hey, can we drink? You know, I think we need to drink and listen to some melancholic music because I fought <laughs> with my girlfriend or because she left me or because I found something that hurt. And all we're trying to do is that, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm even reading about alcohol, alcohol is not an antidepressant. Alcohol is an actual depressant, mm -hmm. right? So we do we say, okay, we do two, three scotch because in that moment we, we forget about it. Next day, what do we do? So it becomes an addiction now. We medicate on it. People even eating. Yeah, they have eat. dealt with unresolved pain yeah. through their lives. Have you have you guys watched that um, show? This I think is my 600 pound. My 600 pound liar. On TLC. And so they all have something in common. Pain from their childhood. Something happened, something horrible happened to them. And so they rely on food to ease that pain, to, to ease the anxiety. And so they destroy themselves by eating and getting to the point that they cannot move, they cannot function, they, they can just, they're, they're dead, basically, you know, in a, in a body that can, they cannot move. So that's how body gets when we, we don't deal with pain. Because the way we medicate is our way of redirection our attention from unresolved pain mm -hmm. to the true cause of our misery and our pain in that moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to the second way Second way is we motivate, okay? We turn into business and driven ambition to, again, deal with some of this unresolved pain. We even turn into something that Michelle and Jeff taught, uh, and Shannon and Pete even last week on some of those inner bouts. We start telling ourselves, I'm never going to allow this to happen again, right? Someone hurt me in the past, Someone beat me up in school, I will never let this happen again to my life. This person cheated on me, I will never let another man do this in my life. All right? Continue to do on those. And motivation can be very positive because ambition is very positive. We all want to be ambition. I, got, I know some people here who are very successful nowadays because of their ambition and perseverance. But some of that ambition, when it's driven by pain, can lead to damaging behaviors. Okay. Right. And so I, you know, like I, I always tell this story about the fact when I met Luis, I, I used to be very independent. I come from, I mean, even though my parents are married and they have a beautiful marriage, my mom's side of the family is, um, you know, based just on powerful women who never depended on a man, who were always self-providers. And so that's what my mother taught me. So when I met Luis, I remember I was like, I will never depend on you. And I, it's like, I don't need you, you know? And it was very damaging, I guess, because of the way I was, I was raised and because of the inner vows that we talked about last class that, you know, one day he came up to me and he said, hey, you always make me feel like you're alone. I'm here with you and I'm, you know, fighting with you to, you know, to provide a better future for our kids. <clears throat> but you always make me feel like it's you and only you. And that's because of the pain that we carry, not only because of our experiences, but because of my, in this case, my mother experience, you know. And so we bring those, those hurts and pains to our actual, you know, actual relationships. And it's, it's terrible. I mean, he was hurting so bad. And, you know, even in tears, he was like, you're hurting me. I mean, by saying those things, you're, made me, you're making me feel like I'm nothing to you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and going back again, I think we, we hear it so many times that, I mean, these books and these classes give us so many tools to continue to improve on our marriages. But the best stories, 
uh, of success, of pain, of, of ambition, we can read them in, in our manual, right? Which is our manual, the Bible. And even in the Bible, it, it goes in depth talking about King Solomon, right? I just talked about King David. King Solomon is the son of mm -hmm. King David. And looking at his life, he's born into a scandal. Because he's born into a life of King David and Bet Betseva, right? Is that how you pronounce it? Bechiva, sorry, Bechiva, and so you're already born to that part of the scandal. Continuing then that, he he is with one of his <laughs> brothers who's trying to kill him. He's trying to kill his father to take over the throne. Then even King Solomon is being taken into killing his one of his brothers as well to take the throne. So he's building to a family of crime, hate, so much anger, already a scandal from. From uh, uh, out of wound, uh, right? Uh, out, of out of wedlock, right? So you're already coming to so much pain and suffering in that respect. But when you look into King Solomon's life, the Bible says that King Solomon was probably the wisest man in the entire Bible, right? He was the one who who set out. He said, "I'm gonna build Israel to be the richest nation in the world, more than King Saul had." more than my father King David did, and he actually did. He built a beautiful garden. He built the best temple the Bible has ever talked about. It was wealthy. He had every single uh, monetary part he had because he was ambitious in that respect, right? So his motivation, that pain and suffering that he had, that he never had <laughs> resolved, motivated him to build this beautiful Israel. But then the Bible talk says this, yet when I survey, all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. What does that tell us? That even after all these beautiful things he built, he still felt that it was meaningless. He was depressed. All right? So he became this workaholic. So he became this workaholic, and it happens sometimes in our lives. My wife in the past, I have some, probably some unresolved pain. Maybe there's some of us, or in that moment, that we felt in a way or another that we couldn't, we don't want to go home because there's unresolved issues in our relationship, in our marriage, in our lives, and then we don't get out of our offices in time, or we <coughs> look for other ways to stay longer in the office. Or we make up excuses, oh, traffic was probably longer than the normal, uh, honey. Uh, if you guys ever seen the movie Marley and Me, you know, with the dog, the guy stands outside the house, like sometimes he was like, oh, God, do I really have to come in this house? And there's like three kids jumping around, the dog, you know. And, 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 and it's some of those pains that we have that we continue to build that not only damages us individually, but then... When we're married, it damages this, the most important gift God has given us. Okay, third part. Talks about is we meditate. Okay. So um, basically, um, it's like when we take the pain and we become a victim. And so we develop this victim mentality. And we're always pouring, you know, every person that cross our, our path, we're always like, you know, this happened to me, and poor me. And, you know, you're always in that victim mentality. You cannot get out of it. And he even, you know, said something that was very funny in this book, that churches are filled with people who like to be, you know, who are victims. Martyrs. Not like martyrs. Like they with like medi mediators. Exactly. They like to victimize themselves and they like to talk about it. And so church is a safe place to, you know, be martyrs and to be victims. And um, so the way we um, uh, basically is um, they we find a pleasure in bitterness instead uh, in finding consolation over the word of God or relying on the word of God. And, and again, going on, on part of the Bible, too, you go again, kind of building around similar topic with King David, one of his brothers, Absalom, with Assam, they, you know, he rapes 
<clears throat> you know, one of uh, his wives. So, but he never dealt with this pain. So he just stayed quiet. Okay. So what did he do? He went into exile for three years. And during this exile, all he did was build up this anger, this unresolved issue. He comes back into Israel, and all he started to do was talk bad about King David because King David, his big brother now, didn't do anything about it. Did not punish his other brother for doing such a crime, for raping his wife. So he built on this anger. He never went up to God and said, God, I need you to resolve this issue. Or in that moment, go up to his brother, I don't know, smack him in the face and say, okay, I got, got it, I got to resolve now. But no, he didn't say anything because he wanted the King David to do something about it. He comes back after three years with this unresolved pain and he started mediating, saying he started building on this anger, talking so bad about it, plotting King David's death, doing all that is possible. So that mediation actually turns into a, this pain turns into <clears throat> as a justification to harm others. And as my wife just said, what we see a lot sometimes in our churches, which we know we say church is a welcome place for anybody, but he talks about here the churches are filled with mediators, people who are constantly looking for an audience, an audience to talk about their problems, who's willing to listen, who's willing to 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 say, Oh, poor you, yeah, I understand you. Because even when we went through our crisis, my wife was going everywhere in church to one of her worldly friends, to every person she could, Facebook, anywhere she could, for people to say, oh yeah, what a what a butthole I am. What a terrible thing Louise did to you. You are so right to do this. That was what the world was telling her. When she came to church, it's funny, we went to counseling, we went to Stephen's ministry, we used to pray with the people on, on the altar. We came to this class. Can you believe that everywhere she went, she says, they all suck. They don't know what they're talking about. I'm like, what do you mean they don't know what I'm talking about? I, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, it's not working for me. She's like, of course it's working for you because yeah. you're the one who, who, who did the I thing. Wanted, I wanted to hear. She wanted to hear. What oh, I wanted yeah. to hear was you need to get divorced. That's what you need to do. He's so bad. He's so mean. You don't deserve that. Get divorced. And of course, I never heard that. You know, especially from church, you know. It's, everybody was like, no, you have to actually forgive. I was like, forgive? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. And, I and it's like, I mean, <laughs> Mike comes from uh, doing consulting classes. And in, in, in the consultants, in business consulting, your job <laughs> is to look for ways to improve efficiency for the most part in a business and hopefully add to the bottom line. Even if that means most of the time telling that company owners or whoever it is what you're doing wrong, right? You're not there to tell them what they want to hear, but you have to tell them what they need to hear, right? right? In this case, that's what my wife didn't want to hear. So she was being a mediator. She was dealing with her pain right. that moment, not to criticize no, or no, judge, no. but but this I think this was a great example in that moment to go out and, and say, oh, Poor can, you, can you believe yeah. he cheated on me? <laughs> can you believe he did this to me? You know, how can you go? And Mike laughs because he's like, mm -hmm, yeah, I think he did. But when she did that to the world outside of church, that's what happened. When she came to church, people were saying, no, you have to forgive. Not forgive and forget, which we, that's not we talk about that. It's not forgive and forget because then we go back to the time heal things. And it's not that case. But it's more, if you're, if you're going to stay with him and you're going to forgive that person, then you got to now, like on the chapter, Shannon taught chapter 3 last week, now we're in chapter 4. Move the chapter. It's not that you forgot about chapter 3, because none of us here most likely didn't forget about chapter 3. It's in the back of our head, but now we got to turn the page, yeah. right? And, and, and that continues to happen to us. So mm -hmm. in that moment, my wife had to say, okay, I got to take a step back. And I said, baby, if none of these people are working for you, <laughs> you have to deal and I'm here to help as much as I didn't want to <laughs> because it hurt me, right? We were going into big fights. He was my punching bag, of course. Uh, and, and the throwing target. Uh, <laughs> but in that moment, she said, you know something? You're right. I got to deal with this pain by myself. I got to go to God. Yeah, and, and that's what it became, basically, was between me and God. And that's how we resolved this, you know, like, because... Of course, nobody was going to tell me what I wanted to hear. 
and and I didn't want to hear anybody. <laughs> so it was basically me and the word God, and and sometimes Mike. <laughs> but it worked. At the so end. Claudia, what did you do during that time? Did you get quiet? Did you go find your own space? Did you read the Bible? Did I you pray? What, what I happened? did, a lot of I couldn't pray because I was so mad. I mean, I was so upset. I, I actually got really mad at God. Because, you know, I was like, I'm coming to church. I'm doing what is right. Why does this happen to me? I mean, I didn't feel it was it was fair. Right. So I couldn't pray, but I knew that God was still in the throne. So I didn't. I just didn't know how to reach him because, I, you know, I felt that if I was going to speak to him, I was going to be mean to God. <laughs> so the only thing that I did was I worshiped. And so I put worship music all day long. That's what I did. So I worship God and I did, and I also, YouTube became my best friend. I was listening to every single preacher out there Good. about relationships, about healing, about forgiveness. And so that's how, you know, the Holy Spirit actually started working with me. And, and I can say for a full year, you know, uh, I, I used to be so mean to this <laughs> group. I used to be like, I don't love you. And I, I remember telling him, I don't love you. I don't love you. And he was like, it's okay. You know, I can, I can love you and give the love that you're not giving me for now. You know, he was providing for both of us, for, for, for that love, you know, for, for a very long time. And it was just one day that I was coming, I actually was in class and I think Mike and, and Jen were giving the class that day. And, and Mike went full blown about his uh, testimony and that was my breakthrough. So it was just like from one day to the other. I mean, the next day I woke up and I told him, I love you. That's how fast it was. I mean, fast after a year. <laughs> hey, it's better than. It's better than nothing. <laughs> and, and, no, and, and it's funny too in that moment, because if, if, if anybody in this room has gone through something that we've gone through, or even some something else in your relationships. First of all, let us tell you guys are not alone. There is help in this church to help you guys. If not, here the ones that we're standing here before you, Mike, Jeff, Shannon, we are all here, okay? Because first and foremost, God told us we got love, okay? And so that's what we want to provide. That's how the fundamental of that Bible starts, and that's why God creates marriage. So we want to be able to share that love with you guys. Second, uh, my wife used to always tell me in those moments, oh, studies say, so studies say, I like studies because I'm very analytical, but there's certain mm -hmm. studies that I like, and I guess I'm very picky. You didn't so, like mine. No, she's like, <laughs> study says that it might take three years for this to get resolved. Oh, yeah. I so are you willing to wait three years? Yeah. And I'm like, wait. I was like, I'm going to talk to you for I'm like, wait, minute. why do I have to wait three years? No. No, she's like, it says it in all the stuff I've been reading about. Uh, and I said, well, and I'm inside, I'm like, really? Three years? Three years of this? You know, before we never fought, and now we're fighting every other day, if not every day. Uh, I'm not sure if I can take it, but I'm like, yes, baby, of course. Uh, like, yeah, of course I'll take the three years. But I used to always tell her, it doesn't have to be three years. Pastor Joel Austin says, our plans and whatever doctors or whoever out there says this is going to happen, he doesn't have the word of the power of you. It's whatever we declare with our mouths and whatever God's plans are, right? And God's plan wasn't for us to wait three years for this to get resolved. God's plan wasn't for us to wait three years to get a brand new house. God's plan wasn't three years for us to be here teaching this class, which it was a dream for us when we went through our crisis. God's plan wasn't three years for us to wait to be in the altar sharing our testimony to the world, right? So if you think that that occurs, be, don't believe it because those are whispers and lies from the enemy, right? That was a lie from the enemy telling my wife, got to wait three years for this pain. I got you, girl. And of course, every time I thought about it, I was like, three years? I'm going to kill me. Yeah, she says, I mean, she's like, every time she read it, she's like, I, I can't, every time she would come from work, I, don't, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I'm like, now what happened? I read. And she's like, remember <laughs> the three years? I can't hold that. I can't, I can't last that long. I don't think you can last that long with me three years. And I kept telling her, no, we are getting out of this because we're both going to work. But 
the main part, and it goes back to the whole topic of today, my wife in that moment, as well as me, my wife went and dealt with her unresolved pain, right? Mm -hmm. This pain that I had caused her. I went and, and resolved my pain from my childhood, yeah. sexual addictions, all these problems that I had with sources from the, from, from the church in that moment. I went to look for help in church. Thank God I didn't go into my medication mode because God knows where I would have been. A DUI, lost my job, right? Uh, probably broke by now, would have done something stupid. Everything the enemy would have wanted to. Anything the enemy would have wanted to. My kids seen me in a state where it shouldn't be seen, right? We, we were both dealing with different, I mean, he, you know, I, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. That I've never had those issues, but I've always had the issue that I would resort, resolve my pain when I was in a relationship. If this didn't work, then I would jump to another relationship or to another man. So that's the way I dealt with pain. And and of course, my first reaction when I found out he was cheating on me was like, I'm gonna cheat on you. And you're gonna feel how I'm feeling right now. And it's not gonna be one or two, it's gonna be a hundred. You know? So that's what was happening in my mind. And I'm being blunt and honest, because I wanted to hurt him. Right. And that's the way I dealt with pain. And of course, the enemy was, the enemy is, Funny. You know, like I was I was listening to John Gray on Thursday and he was saying, I don't know how you actually picture the devil. We all picture the devil like really ugly with like a funny face and like super scary. But the enemy is usually super beautiful. And of course, there was this guy that suddenly showed up in my life and he was good looking and he was like super like super he had a super job. It, and I was like so tempted to jump and do something to him because it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like I wanted to do something for me. I wanted to do, I wanted to do something to him, you know, I wanted to get even. And I remember just, I, and I always say that I was dancing with the devil literally during that time. But then I realized that I was not the old Claudia, you know, because I left that Claudia in 2002. So I wanted to go to my old ways, but I couldn't. I couldn't, literally. And I think the most important piece of what you guys are saying is that you went and seeked good counsel. You put the Christian music on when you couldn't pray. Mm -hmm. You came and found people that were gonna stand in agreement and pray with you. Cause that's, I think, the part that got you through it. And yeah. it wasn't just waking up one day and you're over. It was everything you did of course. that finally it got to that It was a series point. of events mm -hmm. that we did. And of course we were committed to come to these classes. We were really committed to come to these classes. And I knew something, I mean, because it's, you know, even though it sounds like, I don't know, funny, I guess. Uh, I knew that, I knew God, I already knew God. Yeah. So I knew I was gonna go through my valley of tears, but eventually my, my story we will end up in victory. Yeah. I didn't know how, I didn't know when. Now, I didn't want to deal with it because it's uncomfortable and it hurts no, and it's painful. But um, but I did. And, you know, I when I actually I surrendered myself and when I said, all right, let's do this. I don't know how it's going to happen, but let's do it. And I took a step of faith and I just let God into our situation and I started healing everything that I was that was unresolved in my life. That's when we saw the hand of God over our marriage. And it brings us sort of to wrapping everything up into a conclusion where it goes back, to, so kind of giving you a re-emphasis, time does, is not going to heal that pain. So if you're dealing with pain now from one way or another, please resolve it for yourselves, for your own sake, individually. Because you, if this is right, like Pete was saying, God told him in a free way, hey, it's not her, it's you. Resolve with this issue first, then that's going to continue to work. Same here. Okay? So, and time is not going to heal that because there's some resolve problems in yourselves. But, and then we talk about the three ways we as society tend to deal with pain. Positively, negatively. Those are not positive ways to do it. Right? What is the best way? What is the only way we should be dealing with pain 
and suffering and some of those resolved issues is in Matthew 5, 4, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Okay? He's not saying here, Jesus is not saying, oh, it's okay for you to be sad. It's okay for you to be in pain. Because mourning hurts. It does kind of suck. It's okay to cry when, when someone hurts you. It's, he's not saying don't cry. But he does say, when life gets hard, bring your pain to me and I will comfort you. So it's okay to mourn, but mourn with me. Okay? Bring that over to me. Just like my wife did in that moment. Just like us, we're telling you to do after you leave this class. If there's something going on, admit your pain and your hurts and bring it to God. Because he's the only one. He's the best counselor. He's the best one who's going to be able to help us and resolve those issues. Through prayer, through praise, through reading the word of God, through reading some of the resources out there that are biblical, that are going to tell us to help us resolve those uh, pain. Get on down to our knees and say, Jesus, I give you this pain. When that happened, I remember I went out to my knees and said, God, I need your help. I give you my addiction. I give you my problems. I give you my pain to you because I don't want this to be over. And whatever you need to do to help me get fixed, I need you to do it now because there's now or never. Right? And that, in that moment, I felt, I started crying, started crying. I felt hot because I felt kind of the Holy Spirit went in me, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I gave it into God. So take a moment this week after class. If there's something going on with you and you, close your eyes and say, Jesus, I give you this pain. Jesus, I give you all the unresolved problems unto you. And please allow the Holy Spirit. I give you permission, Holy Spirit, to control me, to control my heart, my thoughts. And go back to that moment when I was five years old and someone touched me. Go back to when I was seven and my father said, I don't believe in you. When I was rejected in 11th grade by a teacher who says, you're not good enough. And then I, I bring that into life. Go back into that moment and say, God, please show me that moment and help me fix it. Because I need to resolve that pain in my heart. Okay? Done. Perfect. So, we'll, we'll, uh, any further questions, concern, uh, no? So, we'll probably close in prayer and we'll let you guys get a chair in service. Okay? I think... Pastor Clay and Ashley will be happy we're finishing yeah. five, seven minutes before, <laughs> and we get to go listen to us. Okay. And Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be here, Jesus, because this is a safe place for us. Because you tell us through your word, Father, that you are there for us, that we should give you our pain and our sufferings because you are there, Jesus. That anything that's going on in our lives, Father, you help us fix it in this moment. That you come before all the couples in this class. Not only come between them, but come on, on top of them. Come under them and, and surround them, Jesus, with your presence. That these couples in this room continue to be strong bonded, Father. That whatever the enemy wanted to take away is trying to take away. Or whatever he wants to take away in the future, we step on it. We reject it in the name of Jesus Christ. We don't believe it. We don't take it. And we believe that all the pain, all the healing, uh, all the pain is going to be re, uh, resolved. And healing is coming into marriages. Healing is coming into every single person in this room. Healing is coming over my wife. Because I know, Jesus, you told us that you are there for us, Father. We thank you. Please allow Colombia to win tomorrow. Please. <laughs> we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank <laughs> you.